delighted to have with me today Colin Nelson, who is the Chief Consulting Officer for Hype Innovation. Uh, Hype run one of the large uh, collaboration platforms, a software environment that supports innovation. And we've talked for a long time about the development of this area. So Colin, I wonder, perhaps we could begin by just looking at this question. After all, innovation is incredibly important, always has been, always will be. Um, In the past, it was very much something that specialists did. You had your specialist team doing it. One of the things that collaboration platforms enable is the participation of many more players in that game. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about a brief history of collaboration platforms. Sure. So um, my original background and kind of interest into this area was actually through knowledge management platforms. Mm. And the logic was very sound, which was, if we could get what was in people's heads into a platform, everybody could benefit. And I worked for technology companies who were looking to establish knowledge management platforms within big corporates, typically big government organizations with that ethos. And of course, if you survey the employees, everyone would say, this is a great idea. Of course, if we could only have access to what everybody else knows. However, in practice, those programs were really patchy in, in levels of success, not because fundamentally there was anything wrong with them not because the technologies weren't up to it but because people had day jobs and taking time away from the day job to share when it wasn't of specific benefit to you at that moment was always going to be something you could push off to the future so we had a couple of intersecting worlds of course you know we've had suggestion boxes the dusty old box in the corner <laughs> in you know, manufacturing sites of course we've had um, in some places like germany um idea management programs where the employees are motivated to share small ideas to help with continuous improvement. And we had knowledge management systems, which were patchy at best in terms of their successes. Um, And what happened about 15 to 20 years ago was the organization started to experiment with an alternative way of getting the employee to share. And what we know of that now is what we call an idea campaign or a challenge where we pose a question to an audience and invite them to respond against that need. And if you think about it in these terms, it's a pull process. We're stood on the problem and we pull the ideas, the knowledge and the people towards us. That's quite dynamic. It's on demand. We know what we're looking for. Or we can ask carefully worded questions to get the right kind of ideas out of our employees. If we juxtapose that to the alternative, which is very much a push process, this is where knowledge management and the dusty suggestion box come into into the the equation, where we say, okay, if you have an idea on any subject at any time, please pop it into the suggestion box. And we're really dependent on the employee to push it as and when they see fit. So there's no context around what's timely, what's useful to the business. And of course, implementation rates for those sorts of programs were always really pretty low. Now, that doesn't mean to say there weren't good ideas, there were plenty of great ideas, but getting the alignment between what the business cared about, what it had budget to do, and the idea was the tricky part. And the idea campaign really developed um, through a whole heap of trial and error research projects, looking at the social science around how large or diverse groups of people could collaborate and share online. So, of course, when it comes to human behavior, this gets really interesting because much of it's quite counterintuitive. Well, how long do you give people to share? What sort of information should you ask for? At what point does the amount of information that you ask for start to impinge on the amount of people that want to respond? Mm -hmm. So there's all these sort of factors. And actually about, um, oh, must be about 10, 12 years ago, I started to map out all the moving parts. I came up with 50 moving parts, which which (laughs) affected that people shared, collaborated, and at what level of quality. So quite complicated. But over time and through experimentation and trial and error, as an industry, we started to get better at this. And we started to be able to leverage collective intelligence on whatever thing we were looking for. Of course, primarily for ideas for purposes of growth um, uh, and innovation, but also expanding upon that into places like continuous improvement and cost reduction. So that's one big part of it. The other thing is we've seen this big uh, increase in, in social media. So the software companies building the idea management platforms with this pull process embedded in it, this campaign methodology, also could learn from the likes of Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram and so on and so forth on what kind of applications do people like to use. And so they could make nice looking software, which was quick and easy to get through, which people enjoyed using, marry that to this 
uh, new pull ethos to create now what we have, which is the modern um, online innovation management software uh, software market. And what you'll see here is many corporates, many non-for-profits, even governmental organizations starting to leverage these programs for whatever purposes they're trying to achieve in their companies, wherever they have a scale need, you know, more people than we can fit in a room. That's absolutely fascinating. And uh, I know there are many good examples now of companies that are doing this or organizations in the public sector as well. Um, I guess one of the things that that begs, one of the questions it begs is, if you're then sourcing ideas, do they only need to come from inside your organization? And I, I guess not. And I think you probably know where I'm going with this. What about bringing in other players, other stakeholders like suppliers or customers? Yeah, so do we go outside the organizational boundary, you know, often called open innovation? Um, of course, if we accept the principle that more heads are better than, than, than less heads, and we do that all the time, we run brainstorming sessions, we ask friends and colleagues what they think, we're always trying to get the best expertise and knowledge that's around us. If we expand upon that principle to say, I don't just want the best expertise and knowledge that exists within my network, but I am also interested in what the company has. At a certain point in time, you realize, well, we, we, we're not an island. We also exist with part of an ecosystem and with suppliers, academic partners, customers, maybe consumers and wider society. There will be ideas and innovations and creative ways of thinking that exist beyond our organizational boundaries that we could benefit from. So the maturity of an organization as it gets used to this is, yes, they often start inside, but once they see the value, they quite often start to step outside. And by, by far and away, the most popular use case and starting point for, for this is go, go to the supply chain. So your existing suppliers, the people with um, a vested interest in your success. So you can actually go and have a look online, if you like, at a program called Axon Abel's Paint the Future. So if you just search for Paint the Future, you'll find it. And that is Axon Abel, the paint company's open innovation platform for gathering insights and ideas from suppliers, from new startups, um, and also from academia. And if you're interested in the type of business that they're in, if you're a, a supplier to, to, to Axnabel or perhaps an organization with a new and innovative chemical compound that can be of relevance, there's a place for you to go there where not only can you share, but you also get to learn a little bit about what they're trying to achieve. So there's, again, that alignment between objective and what's shared. So supply chain innovation is by far and away the most popular um, online uh, extension to these internal programs. And of course, you can complement that with new and emerging um, startups and scale-ups, companies with capabilities that perhaps didn't exist five years ago, not just the established supply chain. But we can also look at the alternative view. What about the customers? Mm. Now, consumers are tricky because, of course, consumers <laughs> don't really have a natural motivation to necessarily help the company that's asking. In some places, there'll be brand loyalty, but by and large, we don't see too many consumer-orientated programs. There are a few out there. Um, Mattel, uh, My Ideas, is, a, is an interesting one to mm -hmm. explore if people want to share ideas on toys. But often, if you start looking at the details, whenever we're dealing with consumers, the company always wants to hold all the IP. They want to hold all of the data. And that's going to discourage anybody with serious business ideas to share. What tends to happen better is when we're dealing with closed open innovation, where we're dealing with one or several customers at once in a B2B environment. Mm -hmm. So a good example of that would be Fujitsu. Um, here in the UK, Fujitsu are a services company primarily. And they have a program that's formerly called Activate. It's now really co-creation, where they run campaigns online with the leadership of their customers to identify real business problems. So, so the stuff that perhaps doesn't get talked about, they're a technology company, of course, but they want to understand what's the macro need out there? What are you really, what's really keeping you up at night? And they've rolled this program out incredibly successfully, and they've had executive teams from their clients, um, people like Heathrow Airport and government organizations, mm. to come together to share their problems, and they absorb those. They run internal campaigns to see how they can solve those and create new capabilities on the back of that, often with the customer. So they use this as the starting point from a co-creation activity to create new offerings that really match customer needs. Now, if we think about supply chain, we think about um, customers, there's also another area, which is wider society. And mm -hmm. we do quite a bit of work in the non-for-profit NGO space. And a, an interesting program that we've seen most recently is with UNICEF, a program called Reimagining the Future. 
where UNICEF coordinated with, I think, 13 or 14 other um, large charities, people like, say, the Children, the WWF, mm -hmm. Amnesty International, to look at the future of fundraising. And so as, an, as, a, as a group of organizations, could we do something that could help share best practices and ideas from each other on how we can fundraise better? And this was open to the general public, so anybody could participate. And they had hundreds of sub submissions, which are now going to go into a portfolio that can be shared with that entire sector to say, if you're struggling to wonder what to do to how to increase fundraising, here are ideas that we will all benefit from collectively. It's really interesting in terms of a way of transforming that whole sector. It's, it, it, this is fascinating, not least because, in a sense, uh, what you've been doing is creating a platform. You've used the word yourself, an ecosystem across which and around which all sorts can happen. And it, it, mm. it, it's far more than that lonely suggestion box on the factory floor a long time ago. Um, but that then raises a question in my mind. With just so much knowledge bubbling away in this soup of possibilities, um, you said you have a background in knowledge management. How on earth do you keep track of all of that? And how do you avoid reinventing wheels? Yeah, so I mean, of course, there needs to be a governance layer around this to ensure that we uh, we plan accordingly, we target our um, our, uh, our needs. I think, how best to, to phrase this, I think if you follow the logic of starting with more heads, the better than, better than less heads, and expanding that program and program and program until the point where you really have collective intelligence as a utility in the business, where it doesn't matter what your need is, if we have more uh, need for ideas for new products or services or business models, or we want to reduce costs or, or support change management initiatives, whatever it might be, wherever we need scale, you're going to generate a lot of ideas, mm -hmm. a lot of content. Mm -hmm. And some organizations talk about having 15, 20,000 different ideas in a database that they potentially can exploit and utilize as things change. But the question then is, well, how do we manage that? Mm -hmm. Going back to this mm -hmm. knowledge management conversation, and of course, systems can identify trends, they can look at themes that are developed, but what happens if Division A generates an idea and it does so in a silo, but then implements it for great value, but the other silos don't know about it? How do we engineer that? Now, the most progressive organizations are putting in place what we would call innovation curators, people whose sole responsibility it is to identify opportunities for making connections between different knowledge groups, for saying, this idea made it over here, maybe it can make it over there. Well, this one just fell short over here, but in this diversion, in this area, it might be possible we could exploit it to a greater extent. So their job is to actually manage it and organize the data and start making extra connections across these complex enterprises. It's kind of a fascinating uh, world to explore because, of course, it's always searchable. We can always go and find it. But it doesn't mean the right people are looking to the right things. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Now, I'm fascinated because it, it, it would be easy to caricature the availability of platforms as simply a version of the 1990s database where you just threw all the knowledge in and there it was, knowledge management. Right. Clearly there's more to it than that. But I, I like very much the phrase curation because that, that, that does conjure the sense of, of understanding where it might be relevant, bringing it to the attention of others. It, it's I, I can see a sort of art gallery or museum curator in my mind as you use that. Exactly, yeah. But perhaps I could sort of push a little further. You, you, you mentioned a moment ago the social science behind some of this. And, and I guess we shouldn't forget that at the heart of this, no matter how much clever software there is, it's people. People are the ones with the creativity and the experience and so on. And bringing them together, you can amplify that. But in a sense, it's all about people. And it's a largely voluntary act. You don't have to give up your ideas, it's something you choose to do. I wonder if you could comment a bit about that awful word, but well, just in terms of it covering so much, but the culture that we need to create to enable successful collaboration and innovation. It's a great question. Um, I'm actually going to take a slight step back from the word culture and, and mm. move move through it as we, uh, as we progress, because it's not actually just culture that has an effect here. It's also company structure. And of course, it's the targets and the objectives that an organization has, which need to be considered as a collective. So culture is going to affect, of course, the way in which people share and collaborate and how, how involved they get. But that's also needs to be considered in, if we're a very flat organization, where we have devolved responsibility, we kind of probably think about these things differently. 
Um, equally, if we're an organization that's thinking about long strategic innovation windows, maybe 20 to 30 years out, we're going to think about it differently than perhaps a fast moving organization who can turn out a new product in, in three to six months. So these three things need to be considered in, 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 in unity. Because I mentioned earlier, there's these 50 moving parts in terms of ensuring people share and collaborate. Well, of course, they're not the same in every company. There may be 50 different decisions we need to make, but the application of them is quite different. And of course, it depends on these three factors, culture, structure, and objectives. Now, some organizations will say, I don't think we're ready for this new stuff. I'm not sure our culture is ready. I've never found that to be true. What I have found to be true, though, is that the topics that you go after and how you go about this may need to be adapted depending on the organization's culture. So by and large, if we're a complex multinational with people in different locations, we're going to have to deal with it slightly differently. Um, your average American is going to be much more open to this kind of approach than your average Far Eastern uh, employee, you know, where perhaps they come from more hierarchical cultures, where they worry about what their boss might think a little bit more than your average American, or perhaps the leadership are less comfortable advertising their innovation problems more publicly they fear that it looks like maybe I don't know something. So we have these sort of cultural hierarchies, which are partly geographical, but also working style, levels of education, age and demographics. These all have factors and an influence. So the approach that we tend to do is say, let's go simple to start off. Let's think very carefully about what's a minimum viable starting point. And that normally means let's solve a problem that we're trying to solve today, but use a different method to do so. Demonstrate the success of that and then start to expand the scale and the scope of the program to move the culture gently towards a place where it feels more comfortable really getting involved. So that might mean let's make a small incremental improvement on something we're doing today. But because we need 100 people in this conversation, not 10, we're going to do it online. And we don't explain the platforms to them. We just say we need more people than we can fit in a room for this conversation. So we're going to use an online tool. We don't yeah. explain brainstorming sessions. Let's not explain idea management to systems either. <laughs> Let's do it rather than trying to present it too carefully. We do it by stealth. And of course, once people say, ah, I get this now, I can suddenly con uh, be in concert with my colleagues in South Africa and in Russia and in North America. Suddenly, I can have conversations that weren't possible before. Now, this is great. Let's do more of this. Mm -hmm. Let's start solving other problems at scale. And of course, as the culture becomes more comfortable and used to this method of working, just like we used to email or many other systems, you can start to expand the scope of what we do. Now, if we introduced a conversation that said, let's look at the future of our business for 30 years on day one, people might be a lot more reticent <laughs> yes. because they have very little confidence that the business can aren't carefully implement what's being shared. You know, they're not going to see that. They're going to be left the company, very little motivation for that. Mm. But if we do something much nearer to home where they can see the reaction, the implementation path and, and hear about that much more quickly, belief goes up. And then culture begins to start to change. And over time, what we see is you really can shift the culture to be much more collaborative, much more open and much more adventurous, frankly, in terms of what it's prepared to talk about. That's, uh, again, a, a very interesting picture. It, it, it kind of goes away partly from the, the idea that uh, everyone's got ideas, let's just source them all. It, it's focused, it's, um, it's growing something gradually. I, I, I very much like that picture. Um, but if we carry on that idea of a kind of staircase of oh, enthusiasm, participation and so on, um, you mentioned earlier continuous improvement. And of course, that's where a lot of in the past collective ideation has happened you know people collectively improving work processes but that's an improvement uh, incremental innovation yes. what about the more radical hey there's a new business idea here and so on and partly does that challenge the organization because it's suddenly getting ideas it doesn't necessarily know what to do with yeah and i think that this really comes back to how the pace at which we we start to shift a culture some leaders will get the fact that if they continue to do everything they've all ever done to the same customers selling the same products, over time their revenues and profits are going to drop. The markets will become more competitive, things will change. And some leaders will say, okay, we understand that. And what we're going to do is we're going to put some budget and resources aside to ensure that we can develop the bigger, more strategic things that are going to be important to us. So the organization might not be ready yet. But let's get them ready. Let's start them off with some basic things, start collaborating on some more incremental areas, get them comfortable with this process of enterprise collaboration on new things, show that we can, we can implement. 
And then once they're ready, we're now going to start throwing <laughs> less but bigger questions at people. What is the future of our business? What about this trend that's emerging? How can we take advantage of that? Or what are we expecting to see in terms of technology in five to ten years that's going to affect our, our, our industry? And then sort of looking at that portfolio of ideas, not in this case of saying, this is brilliant, let's do that, but as a portfolio. And we say, okay, of the portfolio that we have in front of us, which of these seem to be the best range of options for us to explore with that budget and capacity that we put to one side? So with this concept of an innovation active portfolio and an innovation shelf, the stuff that we actually park is because we don't have capacity to do everything. Mm. And then continuing that more incremental stuff in, the par in parallel to continually show for the results, outcomes, 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 build belief, whilst in the background we're also developing these bigger strategic things, which of course are going to take more time, require more development, and many employees might not even see during their lifetime within the company. But we build permission and confidence yeah. in the organization. This is an acceptable way to work, and everybody's going to benefit if we work together in this way. What's interesting to me about this is it sounds like a, a, a very um, attractive but strategically led thing. So in a sense, it's where are we trying to go and then how might we best mobilize as many minds on the job as possible. Um, that kind of is a controlled state. We're just at the moment having this interview in the middle of an incredible pandemic, something which has absolutely rewritten the rules of the game and we don't know where it's going to end. Um, yeah. We certainly need a lot of innovation and thank God we've had a lot around vaccines and ventilators and all the other stuff. But in a sense, if ever there was an occasion when we needed the kind of collective intelligence, it's right now. I wonder if you could comment a bit on the role that platforms can play and indeed the role that collective intelligence can play in dealing with those unexpected but huge strategic events. Yes, it's been fascinating, honestly. Um, different organizations have reacted in different ways, but we, we surveyed our clients to find out what is it you've actually done since COVID hit with your innovation programs. And of course, some big strategic stuff had to be paused because other really urgent things needed to happen. But what some organizations have found is, well, now everyone's working from home, we're really struggling to collaborate. We're not getting the benefit of these small uh, focused conversations anymore. So in many cases, these collaboration platforms have seen massive increases in usage. Some clients speaking to me about three or four times increasing wow. in terms of the number of the amount of campaigns and engagement that they're seeing, but on a broader range of topics. Um, of course, COVID specifically and this, this current pandemic has also steered what people have been focused upon. So the initial reaction was emergency planning related. Mm -hmm. It was right. What do we need to do now just to keep the lights on? Given this incredibly unpredictable set of circumstances, how do we ensure that the business continues to operate in a meaningful way? Then, of course, people get used to this you know, so-called normal, this different way of working. And then it became more about, OK, we've, we've reacted to the initial panic. How has this changed our customers? How has this changed our, our, our clients? What is their world now? Do we still have the right portfolio capabilities to serve those groups? Or do we now need to innovate our own business model simply because our customers' environments have changed? Not just ours, but theirs have changed as well. And as we begin to transition out of these sort of you know, lockdown situations, we've seen a sort of a third set of conversations happening using these platforms, which are we made lots of changes during this period, some of which we liked, some of which we didn't like so much, but were necessary. Are there things and changes that we want, we, we made that we actually now want to keep? Because we got permission to ask these really tough questions. In a very practical sense, this could be offices saying, mm. do we actually need all of our employees in those offices? Or were we able to operate just as effectively with people working from home? You know, these are some bigger fundamental questions that perhaps never would have been asked if these circumstances hadn't presented themselves. Of course, there was sort of more tactical things of, all right, could we shift our manufacturing to now create, you know, protective uh, clothing or can we create you know, hand sanitizer? And we saw lots of that as well. <clears throat> and in certain engineering companies, we saw things really tangible, like how do I operate that piece of machinery without touching it? <laughs> and could I create you know, something online which allows me to have multiple people using the same piece of machinery without any of them touching it? So really fascinating tactical problem solving using innovation tools to help make this palatable and workable. 
And, and, and I guess one of the questions that I've been fascinated by with this idea of collective intelligence is it's not just the volume of ideas, it's also the variety, which is a function of different people coming at it from different angles. Mm. And I know there's been quite a lot of research around that. This seems to be one of those situations where that kind of uh, recombinant, that kind of different worlds colliding really is important. Mm. I wonder if you have any examples from what you've seen over the past year or so of that sourcing and colliding of ideas from very different directions. Yeah, I think um, we see this all the time, honestly, not just COVID times, but as soon as organizations start to establish collective intelligence programs, you're giving the ability for people with common interest to come together and share and focus on a common interest. And that may mean engaging with people you've never met before. Um, we had a, a, a media company that found that once they had an enterprise program, they started off divisional, and went division by division by division. Once they had the enterprise program, they realized that they could sign energy generated in, say, Poland, which was then developed in Croatia and then was piloted in Tobago <laughs> because different parts of the organization were at different readiness levels to adopt and test and validate these things. They accelerated the journey of, from idea to implementation much, much faster than it had been kept in the silo. And these were three groups, three divisions that perhaps would never have met. There was no reason for them to come together. They did essentially the same thing, but in different markets. But given the ability to come together, we're able to start accelerating this innovation process. So part of it is that. Um, I think the other thing we've seen is to try and bring, obviously, very, very disparate thinking to, to the table. So we supported a, a hackathon with the government of Togo. Hmm. We invited... Togo, um, the, the citizens of Togo, to start sharing their ideas about how do we react to COVID. We're not necessarily as wealthy as some of these Western companies that have been exposed to this. We won't have the same set of solutions. So are there other things that we could do, maybe using sort of jagad type principles, to think how can we, with our limited resources, respond as well as we possibly can and bring together citizens from all over the country to share literally again, dozens and hundreds of ideas on how Togo could respond to this pandemic. Again, this would never have happened without the pandemic and without the experience of these sorts of platforms, but hugely beneficial, and it created us to the portfolio of activities that Togo, government of Togo could implement to really make a tangible difference, and you know, hopefully save, save lives. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, Colin, we're, we're slowly running out of time, but uh, let, me, let me throw one more question at you, if I may. Um, we started with the kind of the 19th, uh, the, the 20th century, but the very early days, suggestion boxes and so on. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are some very serious limits to what you can achieve with that. But now we've moved into this almost golden era of collaboration platforms where, as you've been describing so eloquently, so many possibilities there. Perhaps you could do a bit of looking forward into the future, so a bit of stargazing. What well, do you see? As, <laughs> what do you see as the big challenges, the big opportunities in the area of collaborative innovation? So I think there's a, a set of trends that we can see the direction of travel quite clearly, and then there's other stuff that's sort of emerging on a day by day basis, which is fascinating as well. I think the first thing is you'll see way more business to business online open innovation. So where companies coming together to deal with the natural pinch points that exist between companies where you've got big company, big company, relatively small number of people talking to each other. So that is a growing trend and that's going to continue. So we'll see way more open innovation uh, at scale. Of course, open innovation is new. Mm. Doing it this large scale is, is, is certainly something that's, that's quite, quite interesting and relatively new. I think you'll see an embedding of the uh, of the, the perspective that collective intelligence is a utility, like we saw mm. from knowledge management, but didn't quite get there perhaps as much as we wanted mm. to. But I think as organizations progress, they're saying, okay, this isn't just ideas for innovation. This isn't just ideas for cost saving. This is collective intelligence as a utility. And it should be treated like we treat email and other databases and other utilities that we have, that we tap into as and when we need them. I think in terms of leadership, uh, in companies, what you begin to see is a higher level of knowledge and understanding of what innovation can bring to an organization. And I'm sure you'll share this perspective that a lot of executives, they're still very quite naive about what innovation is, what expectations they should have for innovation departments, how they should measure innovation, the progress that their teams make. 
And I think the, the more that happens, the more that we do, the more the industry expands and shows impact, the more you'll see an educated leadership starting to emerge about realistically what do we do with innovation, as opposed to just throwing it away in it after a couple of years because it hasn't generated <laughs> something magical that perhaps yeah. we might have hoped with. So I think that, that level of knowledge is, is going to be interesting as, as organizations mature. Um, I think the other area that's quite interesting is, is bringing together the big and the small. So um, certain sectors, you know, think about financial services, think about the legal sector and legal tech, um, think about the pharma sector. They're often very dependent on small emerging companies to be the vehicles for innovation. So a big, a big bank will have a group of people that look to venture with um, financial finance, fintech type companies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what we'll see, I think, is a lot of that work going online, organizations starting to organize the process of engaging with these third parties, maybe automating some of the assessments of those third parties, looking at them in terms of sustainability, maturity, venture prospects, and doing a lot more of that automatically, bringing together the many small companies with the interested larger companies online at scale, because the manual process doesn't, doesn't scale very well, and, and it's creaking already at the seams. So we're starting to see that emerging as well. But I think these are, that's a set of really interesting trends, way more business to business open innovation, and even to the point where you may see ecosystems of companies coming together, especially in the areas of things like sustainability. Mm. So if I care as an organization about whether my company is sustainable, I have to care about whether my suppliers have uh, sustainability at their heart as well. But what about their suppliers? Now, these are conversations that are difficult, but if we have the ability to bring a supply chain together to have those conversations, and that gets really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So you'll see more um, uh, networks and ecosystems coming together on topics where there's, there's common good. So yeah, collective intelligence and utility, way more business-to-business -business open innovation, uh, more highly educated leadership function around innovation, and of course, this integration of the, the small to the big. I think that's going to happen uh, over the coming years. That's a, a lovely optimistic note to end on. I have to say from a personal point of view, I've, uh, I've been in the game a long time and uh, not least I spent a lot of time in the 1990s on total quality management. And mm -hmm. I guess what was fascinating about that, the quality revolution, was that quality moved from being a small thing that was done by a few specialists to something that everyone took a part in. And yeah, what you're painting here is a picture and some of the tools to enable us to move to what you could loosely call total innovation management. So Absolutely. thank you for the, the optimism and thank you for some wonderful insights, Colin. Um, I think people can also find some case examples and more information on the company website and I'll, I'll make sure I include a link. But for now, Colin, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you, John.